Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Community Conversation with Hannah Joy TV. I'm your girl, Hannah Joy Gebra Selassie, and today we are joined by a very special guest. We have Andom Gebra Girgis, who is in New York right now. Welcome to the show, brother. My Gebra sister, good to be here. Good to be here. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Gebra, Team Gebra, you already know. what. How, exactly. many, how many characters is your last name? Shoot, 14, I think. You beat Damn. me by one. I'm 13. I think because you, you don't have an H in your in your Gebra, right? I don't know. So. Yeah. That H, darn it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, everyone, welcome wherever you are tuning in from. As you all know, we love to send a lot of positive vibes, a lot of love. We know that right now, you know, our brothers and sisters around the world are going through challenging times during this pandemic um, amid other incidents that are happening in the world affecting our, our people. And so we're so thankful that we have Andom here today to um, be a voice and to weigh in on some different subjects. So I do want to read a little bit about his bio, and then um, we're going to get into everything from leadership to running for office and general civic engagement, how you can get involved if you feel that now is the time to get involved. Of course, everyone is in different spaces, but this is a, a conversation for you when you are ready to you know, get more involved in the community. So a little bit about Andom. He's a Democrat running for Congress in New York's 16th district. His parents immigrated to the United States in the early 1970s, and they immediately became active organizers with Eritrean and North American Student Association, ENASA. As a child growing up in Mount Vernon, New York, Andom was surrounded by conversations about revolution, solidarity, democracy, and freedom. He's a former New York City special education teacher, and he's um, running for Congress in New York. 16th district to ensure that our resources are invested in the communities and not diverted to forever wars or unnecessary jails. Wow. That's, that's, that's powerful. I guess just right <laughs> off the bat, <laughs> who, who are you? Um, you could just kind of <laughs> break so we can hear from your voice um, instead of, of course, just me. So you can do an introduction. No, I mean, I, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm just a, a, a regular New Yorker, first generation, Eritrean American, um, I, I think I had like a pretty typical upbringing uh, in the sense that, you know, very family and community oriented. Uh, the Eritrean Ethiopian community is not that big uh, in New York. So it's like, but I feel like this is in all communities. Everyone knows everyone. But, you know, I, I was very privileged to be able to uh, grow up in a community that, uh, again, was very much uh, investing and, and really, really realized the importance uh, of investing in importance of community community connections, uh, and solidarity. You know, the idea of solidarity was something that I learned at a very young age, uh, not only thinking about the Eritrean struggle, which my parents were intimately involved with, uh, but solidarity within our community. Um, the challenges that they had immigrating here to America uh, and us being first generation American. So, you know, we were always helping each other and ideas around empathy, um, tolerance, and of course, solidarity. Those are values that I always held dear to me and you know that that was something that was uh, bequeathed to me from my community. Yeah, those are all very important values, and it sounds like you just had such a strong upbringing, strong family, and leaders in your family. And I know with everything going on today, we were sort of talking about it a little bit earlier. But I mean, we've seen what's happening in our in our country, in our society. We've seen these unjust, countless murders of um, our black brothers and sisters, Ahmaud yeah. Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and countless others. Um, so many names, so many brothers and sisters. You opened up a little bit today when you were doing a live chat earlier and you even said, you know, um, just learning more about the George Floyd incident brought you to tears. And obviously all of them, you feel you feel for all of them. But for some reason, something sort of like struck you. Um, what's kind of going through your mind while you're processing all this? And what do you hope changes? Yeah, I mean, there's just so much about this, particularly from the the Eritrean, Ethiopian, even broader African perspective, mm -hmm. um, you know, Within my family, you know, my, my, my parents I, were very, very progressive people, um, very left wing, uh, you know, even by like the standards of like the 80s and 90s, um, certainly today, my mom uh, as well. And, you know, even with that, coming from Eritrea, uh, even though, you know, they, they lived in, in Addis for some time, anti-blackness is globalized. You know, they had internalized racism towards black people immigrating to this country as immigrants to this country. They saw a distinction sometimes between Africans and black Americans. And you know, I saw that within the Eritrean community, not necessarily speaking specifically about my parents, but I saw that within the Eritrean community, the way in which those divisions existed, um, uh, sort of contrasting with pan-African solidarity. Uh, and, and so 
when I think about these cases and I think specifically around like the way in which I grew up, I always remember one moment when I was uh, at the Area Train Community Center and, you know, we were in a, we we're about to drive into a car and basically this person passed us in the car, uh, a black American walking and one of the Area Trains locked their doors as he, as he walked by. And it was just like such a fascinating thing that even I recognized as a young kid. So I was like, wait a second, if, you know, if I'm walking down the street, I see the color of my skin, I'm obviously a black person. Yeah. If someone else would have that reaction to me, I would be pissed off about that. But we were even replicating, you know, in our own ways, this, this sort of white supremacist notion of a fear of this sort of pathological black other. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that was something that for me growing up was something I always had to struggle with. And I was always aware of the fact that, yes, we're all black, but divisions exist and we all have to, you know, fight against internalized anti-blackness. Mm -hmm. But when we see it here in America, you know, we see the ways in which anti-blackness is weaponized through various institutions, housing, education. We saw it with healthcare through the coronavirus pandemic. What I'm looking with policing, I mean, and now with videos, it's something that is just like overwhelming to be able to, to process. Because especially in this case, we saw someone who, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a quick and painless death. You know, we saw someone who in many ways was, was tortured um, to his death. And it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to process. You know, you see the humanity in that individual and, and his life, you know, being basically sucked away as he's, you know, begging for his life, you know, imploring, imploring the, the police officers, these killer cops. So, I mean, it's just difficult. It's really difficult. You know, growing up in New York in the 90s, you know, you hear about this a lot. You know, we had, there was an Abner Louima case of a, of a Haitian uh, immigrant who was brutalized, I think in 95, uh, Amadou Diallo, a uh, famous case of someone, uh, I believe he was from, from Guinea or Senegal, who was shot 41 times. So it's just, it's just overwhelming. It's overwhelming. Mm. It is absolutely overwhelming. And I'm so um, glad that you mentioned some of the points that you did. We have some comments here checking in. Um, Jonas from Vegas says anti-blackness is weaponized. It's true. Um, it is. And, you know, you already touched on so much I, for everyone that's tuning in, by the way, as you all know, this is a community conversation. So if you have any any questions, drop them and we'll try and get to them at the end. Um, of course, we'll try and get to the questions. If we can't, we'll skip or we'll you know, we'll do our best to get to them. But leave your leave your questions and your comments below. Um, so I want to ask you, because, you know, part of your you know, on your website, when you go on to learn about your campaign and everything, you do say that you are fighting for an America rooted in freedom, equality and justice. What does that mean to you? What does that look like? So I think when we think about the foundation of this country, you know, we have to be, be honest about what America is and what America represents. America is a white supremacist settler colonial state, you know, founded on indigenous genocide, founded on land theft, on African slavery. These are the foundations of what this country is. And we see the ways in which that foundation um, and the institutions which are um, based off of that foundation, how they create and, you know, allow to persist uh, gaps between uh, different groups. So in many ways, you know, those are, are gaps and disparities that exist on ethnic lines. Um, we see the ways in which uh, class struggles a lot of times are minimized or reduced towards, again, racial and ethnic and ethnic lines. But when we go to the foundation of this country, the foundation of this country, again, is rooted in, in disparity and in division. And so when we're talking about the present day, the, the present day, we have to look back and understand how the country was founded and the ways in which the wealth gaps connect to that foundation. And so the racial wealth gap right now is one thing that is a huge issue that we have in this country. It's something that us as, as uh, immigrants or first generation Americans, we don't enter into white supremacy and institutionalized racism in the same way that people have been in this country for generations and for centuries. So we need to be honest about what freedom looks like. Freedom for us is not the same as freedom for someone who has been exposed to institutionalized racism for centuries. Equity and justice is not the same for us as it is for someone who's been here for, for generations. And so again, that's just us, about us being honest about what this country is. We can't just lump everyone into, you know, these are all black people. These are all, you know, Spanish speakers. These are all people from Asian countries. We need to be honest about the distinctions that we have, the differences that we have, and then be able to target interventions that are rooted in values that allow for an equitable society. Um, and so when we actually do that, then we can have true freedom. Uh, freedom doesn't exist if people are not able to actually have agency over their choices. And for many Americans, that's just the reality as it is right now. 
Mm. I'm so glad you touched on equity because that's something that a lot of times you hear about quality, but equity, you know, is is just as important. Can you elaborate more, maybe for people who are hearing equity for the first time, can you explain just, you know, equity versus equality? Yeah. So, you know, when we're talking about, it's not just about having the opportunity to, to succeed and an opportunity for everyone to be able to live a dignified life. Um, it's ensuring that justice is part of the process in which folks are are engaging in their daily living. Um, it's ensuring that we have not only an equality of opportunity, but an equality in outcomes that are not allowed to be racialized or exploited based on class differences or gender differences, uh, sexual orientation. So it's about equality of process, equality of opportunity, and ensuring the outcomes that come out um, are not susceptible to uh, sort of any systems of oppression or exploitation. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And I, I see that we do have a couple questions. So I want to go ahead and start bringing them in. Again, if you are tuning in, make sure to drop your comments. Um, if you just want to say hello, you can do that too. Let us know what city you're tuning in from, what state you're tuning in from, what country you're tuning in from. You know how we do. Oh, you international. You international. Okay. We, do, we tend to have people in here from London, Australia, Canada, um, all over the world, af throughout Africa. So let us know where you're tuning in from. Um, I do see some people in here, some friends. Hey, Tron. Hey, good people. We see you. Let's let's get to this question first from Gabriel Amare saying, um, what's your experience? Did you work in public office or other industry? For those of you who are just tuning in, we are speaking with our brother here, Andom, who is running for Congress in New York. So if you can answer that question and tell us a little bit about your experiences. Yeah. You know, I after I graduated from college, I came back to my community and I became a special education teacher. Um, as you know, if you're Habesha, you know, you know, you can imagine the reaction that, that my parents and my, some members of my family gave me when I told them I was going to be a teacher, yeah. you know? So, uh, it was, it was sort of a controversial decision for among some, mm -hmm. but you know, I had seen very, very different experiences in my own educational background. I went to public school in Mount Vernon. Um, and then I went to a really affluent private school. I then went to Yale. Um, and then I went to City College, a public university here in New York for graduate school. So I, I always saw what different schooling experiences look like, and I saw the inequities that existed there. So I knew I wanted to come back. I became a teacher. I taught 10 years uh, special education um, in the New York City area, also taught in Palestine for a summer. Uh, mm -hmm. And I just knew that the, the sort of disinvestment that was going on in our school system, that not only was it inhumane, not only was it a problem, but for the representative and for the district that I'm in, our representative had no problem spending billions of dollars for wars in the Middle East, for militarizing the African continent. No issue with that. But when it came to actually investing in our own community here in the Bronx and Westchester, you know, we saw that things weren't happening. And so that's why I decided to run for Congress, because I was done with, you know, uh, no one actually making a change and a challenge around the fact that we're spending so much money for wars, but not investing in our own community. So in terms of experience, you know, I have experience being in the community. I'm, I'm a teacher. I'm, I'm an activist. Uh, but in terms of public office, the last office I held was I was president of my fourth grade class. That's the last time I held public office. Well, I'm sure that experience uh, shaped you into the, the person you are. So hell yeah, big time, <laughs> big time. Shout out to fourth grade. Um, yeah. And uh, I just want to say we do have some people checking in from San Diego, Dallas, Atlanta. Uh, oh, all over. All over. So thank you all for for those of you who are joining in with us. We're going to get through um, a few different subjects here. So. Definitely drop your questions uh, if you have any. Uh, I also want to uh, address something. The volume is working well, so maybe try to turn it off um, on to Yodi here who is, who's trying to listen. So yeah, just try to play with it because I think everybody's good. Uh, but yeah, let's take another question from our audience member, Tron, my good friend here, who I'm also very, very proud of doing amazing work in Atlanta. Tron asks, what are your top three issues to address in office? And I think this is very important to note too that you know, just because you are in Atlanta or, you know, Vegas or San Diego or Texas, we should be invested in who leaders are across the country, because ideally they're still going to be working toward fighting for all the people of the U.S. Right. And, and who knows where they're going to end up going as they continue to elevate their careers. So I'm really glad to see so much diversity in this chat today, even though our brother here is, is in New York. So why don't you go ahead and take that question? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, right here in our district, we see how. So basically the district that I'm in is, is where the coronavirus uh, epicenter was for the pandemic here in New York. Uh, you might be familiar with New Rochelle, uh, where, where there was the first outbreak and then it spread uh, into where I'm in, Mount Vernon, and then New York City, where it really just blew up. Um, so 
so that's where we are right now. We're in a, an area where um, inequality and economic inequality is very, very apparent, even just I'm talking about within blocks. Like where I'm in Mount Vernon, uh, it's one of only five places in the country where the median black income is higher than the median white income. Uh, it's a very socioeconomically racially diverse area. But you step, you know, two minutes away, just one block over in our neighboring, neighboring town, it's a place called Bronxville, you have one of the mo most wealthy areas in the entire country. Average home price is $2 million. Uh, average taxes that people pay on those homes, about $55,000. And mm. so people pay in the city right next to me or in the town right next to me more on taxes per year than the people in my city earn in a year just in income. Wow. So you can see economic inequality just like it's, it's very clear. It's such a dense area that just, you know, you walk one block over, you can see it. So economic injustice is a huge issue that we have in this country. And one of the ways that we can secure economic justice is by ensuring that we have universal programs um, that are not means tested, that allow everyone to uh, be, guaranteed, uh, be guaranteed the necessities of life, uh, basically decommodifying the basic necessities of life. So right now, what that would mean is single payer Medicare for all. Uh, a federal jobs guarantee. So anyone who is able to work and wants to work can get a job to better our local economy. It means uh, housing for all, the, the homes guarantee. And those are the three main pillars of this program for se securing economic justice. Then we also want to make sure we fully fund public education. So we have securing economic justice, again, through single payer Medicare for all, federal job guarantee, and a homes guarantee. We have uh, fully funding public education. And then the last priority is di divert, divesting from the military industrial complex so we can pursue the multilateralism necessary for a global Green New Deal. These are three sort of buckets, uh, and there are a lot of policies within them, but those are the three main issues that, that we're focused on. Awesome. Thank you for answering that. And to those of you who are tuning in, again, thank you for being with us. Feel free to drop your questions below, drop any comments below. Uh, we're going to just get through some more on this end. I do want to ask you because you, your, your identity is so, um, you know, there's so many intersections with who you are as a person. We were talking about this a little earlier. You know, you are, you know, um, Eritrean, you are black, you are a black man in America, you know, you are a New Yorker. Um, how, how have those experiences sort of shaped your perspective? Because we see what's going on. So many of us in this chat right now are so frustrated um, and just, tired. We're tired of being tired. As everybody's saying, you'll see that all over. It's just, it's so frustrating. I don't even have the words to describe how frustrated we are. So all of these intersections, I just want to know how has that shaped your perspective and how can people, you know, that look like you, that look like me, trust you to be a voice and, you know, represent these communities that are, that are struggling and, you know, being murdered. So how do you- Damn, that second you, question is a big one. Okay, yeah, that's, that's, a good, that's definitely a great question. You know, to the first point around my own identity and how it's shaped me, um, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois uh, spoke about having a double consciousness um, of being black and being an American and the sort of way in which that shaped how he viewed the country and also how the country viewed him. So as an Eritrean American, as someone who's black uh, and also someone who's also American, you know, I always thought, I had like a triple consciousness that I had three identities of mine that sometimes intersected that were sometimes distinct. Um, but in many ways, you know, they allowed me to see America in a very unique perspective that that um, I think informed my politics. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like growing up, for example, I always was just heard that I was Eritrean. Like I heard I was Eritrean. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I guess I knew I was black, but you know, it's not like something that was spoken about in the home, like my blackness, my, my Eritreanness was spoken about in the home. Mm -hmm. And the distinctions and the points of difference that my parents used to speak about were like Eritrean versus Ethiopian or different mm -hmm. tribes in Eritrea, like Tigrinya, Tigre, Kunama, mm -hmm. or Christian and Muslim. Like those were the points mm -hmm. of differentiation. It wasn't always like racial. It wasn't black or white. Um, so I think I had to be socialized into blackness. Yeah. I think I was socialized into blackness through going to school here. Um, but where I grew up, you know, the vast majority of people are children of immigrants. Like in, in where I live, it's mostly a Jamaican uh, community. So even in that, it's a little bit different than, you know, I know you're from ATL. It's a little bit different than ATL. Um, so, you know, for me, I, that was sort of uh, interesting in terms of how that informed my politics. I always was very international and New York is very international as well. Um, but in terms of like how, you know, I'm going to be fighting for our communities, you know, look, I mean, I'm a black man, right? I am also a child of immigrants. Um, I say child of immigrants, even though I'm an adult, you know what I mean? I'm a product of immigrants. Like that's yeah, like the line I, I used to always say, yeah. Um, I'm a product of immigrants. And I think that, uh, you know, within our country, 
we have to acknowledge um, where we are today as black people is because of the struggles of, of African Americans, right? Of black American descendants of slaves. Like we are here in this position and able to be here um, because of the struggle that, that they've taken part in. And I think Africans in general are not, all, they don't always acknowledge that. And I think it's very important to acknowledge. Um, and so I think we have to recognize the unique challenges that, that they have having been in this country and exposed to institutionalized racism for so long. You know, I'm talking about the racial wealth gap. Mm. In general, Africans in this country, you know, in terms of income, they're amongst the highest income, er uh, highest income earners because of hyper selection with immigration. The vast majority of African immigrants until recently were people who have like master's degrees and PhDs because those are the only people they let in. So I just think we need to be honest about our differences. And then when we're honest about our differences, we can target policies that make sure to help everyone. Mm, that is so real. I am so glad you touched on that because some, sometimes I just never know where these conversations will go. You know, we'll have these topics, but you hit on so much there. And I think that that perspective is so important because you can come in and, you know, help based on what the needs are, not assuming that all the needs are the same or just even understanding how um, everything is is sort of connected. Right. And and yeah. like and affected. And so Thank you for that response and thank you. For no, it's so it's so important because especially us as black people, you know, they try to flatten us. They try to mm -hmm. say that we're, we're, we're all the same. And look, I think it's important for us to have solidarity. It's important to have racial solidarity and ethnic mm -hmm. solidarity because we're going up against a state which is a white supremacist state and that has no problem, as we've seen, killing us in cold blood. And mm -hmm. so I think it's important to have solidarity. But with that solidarity, we shouldn't flatten ourselves and make ourselves homogenous or, or monolithic because when we do that it leaves vulnerable groups exposed um i think you know right now is asian american pacific islander heritage months and i think you see it so clearly within the asian american community because everyone says oh model minority they're doing so well as a community but, you know you got southeast asians uh among ref uh, among refugees mm. folks from Viet vietnam laos that are struggling in this country uh you know in new york city the the ethnic group that is most in poverty are Asian Americans. But because of stereotypes, for example, it's not always uh, talked about and they're not able to have interventions dealt with. So we just need to be honest about you know, where we are. Wow, I mean, honesty is the best policy. And sometimes, exactly. unfortunately, we don't always see that you know, from, from people, but I'm so glad you know, um, we're having this conversation and you know, Andam's become a friend of mine over the past year. So I'm so happy that we're able to connect and just weigh in on, on some of these subjects. Um, so yeah, so we have we have a couple questions. I'm gonna get to some of those a little bit later as we move into um, you know campaigning. I do want to just touch on because you are running for office, all right? And you had mentioned um, because for those of you who are tuning in, raise your hand if you know what Humans of New York is. <laughs> raise your hand. I know you know what it is. I do too. And our Andom here was featured randomly on on Humans of New York. Um, and I would love for you to even share that experience. Like, how did that even happen? <laughs> Um, and, and, but one thing you noted in that was that you described the campaign process as a whirlwind, right? And that was before the pandemic. So I can't even imagine <laughs> what it is now. So can you sort of weigh in on, on that experience being featured, um, in Humans of New York and then, and then tra uh, transition into like what your, what's the process been like for you, um, that during that and even after into the pandemic? Yeah. So, you know, Humans of New York, if folks don't know, it has a huge social media following. Um, to be honest, I was just going to a meeting in the city and I ended up being a little bit early. And so I didn't want to wait in their waiting room because I didn't, you know, I didn't want them to bring me into the meeting like super early. I, I need to like prepare for the meeting. So I was just chilling in Grand Central Station. It's like one of the, the main uh, uh, train station in, in Manhattan. And I was just posted up on a wall, just like reading to myself. And some random guy walks up to me and says, hey, can I take a picture of you? And now it sounds really weird if like the way I'm retelling it, like, oh, just a random person walks up to you and says, like, take a picture. Yeah. But I wasn't doing anything. And he sort of seemed nice. And I was like, what's he going to use my picture for? Like, he's not going to use it for anything you know, bad. Like, you know, it's just like me, like, posted up on a wall. What can he use it for? So anyway, he took a couple pictures of me and then he showed me and then he goes, oh, so I'm with I'm with Humans of New York. And I'm like, wow, that's crazy. Because wow. obviously I, I had heard I knew of Humans of New York. I didn't I don't like I didn't follow the page like religiously, but I, I heard of them, obviously. Mm -hmm. So. So yeah, so it became crazy because um, he said like, you know, we did a little interview. Uh, he called me up later, we did some more of an interview, but then it didn't get released until like a month later. So, and he didn't like exactly tell me when it was gonna be released. But yeah, you know, when it came out, like that day, 
I cannot tell you how my phone was blowing up. It was just, I have never seen anything like it. It's, I don't, I also don't wish it on anyone because it was a very overwhelming experience. Mm -hmm. Like thousands and thousands of messages. You can't even keep up. Wow. Um, but it was beautiful because like people were so supportive. Um, as you said, you know, they, I, I spoke about the fundraising process and how it's, like, campaigning is a whirlwind and how, you know, I come from teaching and teaching is real authentic. It's real genuine. I have real relationships with my, my students, my kids. Um, and in campaigning, it's like everything feels transactional. Everything is like, oh, I'm going to do this for you. You're going to do this for me. What can you bring to the table? And that wasn't the world that I was used to. So um, that was an aspect of campaigning that was a little bit difficult for me to transition to. But when Humans of New York happened, I spoke about that and folks were extremely generous. Everyone sort of connected with the story. People were dropping me $5 here, $10 here. A couple of people giving me thousands of dollars and that they've never even met me. So it was just crazy. Wow. Wow. That's, That's insane. Crazy. And I do want to note too, because they, they did put a statement out too saying that it wasn't, you know, they weren't endorsing yeah, yeah. the candidate. However, you know, you just happened, like you were at the right place at the right time. And it was just, I think the message resonated with so many people because it was genuine. Like you said, it was just, you're a human in New York. And it just, it's, <laughs> you know what I mean? It was so real. Um, yeah. So I you know, it's interesting. It's like, it's, um, so when we were talking, he was asking me like, oh, so what do you do? And I was like, yeah, you know, I'm like, I used to be a special education teacher. And then I paused because I knew that when I told him I was running for Congress, he wasn't going to believe me. Because <laughs> literally, I was just like, I'm like a random Negro just like posted up in like Grand Central, you know? Wow. It's like, who would expect that? Um, mm. And so... It was just, you know, it was just like really funny. He couldn't believe it. He was very surprised. Mm. Um, and, and yeah, he was a nice guy. This, this guy, Brandon uh, Stanton, he's the one who runs it. Like yeah. very friendly. You would never su expect or suspect him as, you know, to be the one who, who founded Humans of New York and was like 10 million followers, published this book. He's just a random guy. Yeah. Well, right place, right time. I wouldn't say yes. wrong place, wrong time, because it seemed like you, um, yeah, it was supposed to work out that way. And, you know, you're navigating through this. I want to also uh, mention another group that um, this is more aligned with your campaign, but Habesha's for Undom. This is a group that just kind of came about. What's Habesha's for Undom? And like, mm -hmm. and just tell us how that even came about. Yeah, no, just, you know, very supportive uh, people uh, started out of DMV. Um, Alicia and, and, and a bunch of folks uh, out in uh, in DMV area, some folks who I had met through uh, some Eritrean uh, organizing, you know, they're just like very supportive. They said they wanted to help out, try to organize Eritreans and Ethiopians throughout the country uh, to support the campaign. And they sort of just like took their own, own initiative and created it. And it was great. You know, the love that I've received from the Eritrean Ethiopian community uh, has been just amazing, uh, you know, as you know, like our community is just so generous and so supportive. And I, 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 I would not even be halfway, I wouldn't be anywhere without the Eritrean Ethiopian community through this race. Like I, I no lie, no lie, it's extremely generous. That's really sweet. That's really sweet. I want to show you some comments too that we have coming in as you talk. There's some emoji clapping hands coming in from different people. And uh, we have someone that did ask for clarification on your last name as well. Um, so, Andom Gebra Georgis. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Gebra Georgis, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Gebra um, Gang, Gebra Gang. That's hey, don't here. worry. Don't worry. This person said, I, I'm surviving life. I'm trying, but I know I'm butchering it. Hey, that's fine. You you already you acknowledged it and you asked us for clarification. So, we're, we're going to practice and we're going to get it. <laughs> I appreciate that. You know, in kindergarten, when I was in kindergarten, five years old or four years old, uh, we had spelling tests and like, you know, like basic words, you know, like it must have been like cat or chief. I don't know, like basic words. But I always wanted to get 100 on my spelling test. And my teacher wouldn't allow me to pass my test until I learned how to spell my last name, which is like, you know, you think it's just like, oh, you don't have to learn. It's just like, you know, your last name, yeah. especially if your last name is like Smith or something. But it took me forever to learn how to spell my last name. Uh, mm. And I remember when I finally got it, I felt so proud. And, and it never fit in the Scantron. Sorry to bust your bubble. Right? right? Sorry right. to bust your bubble. <laughs> but yeah, I know. But I, it was, I'm, that's cool that you remember when you were able to like learn it. I don't remember that, that point, but that's so It's true. just because of my teacher, because my teacher wouldn't let me pass my test until I learned it. Wow, what a great teacher. Speaking yeah. of teaching, um, then I'm going to get to some of your points and comments and messages. So keep them coming. Make sure to let us know where you all are tuning in from. I want to ask you, you know, what a, what a beautiful journey, you know, um, being a special special education teacher. I've seen some of the interactions you've had with your students, whether it's, you know, uh, shouting them out on Instagram or them 
tagging you in posts or them shouting. Hot you man, yeah, they're hot mess. Yeah. Y'all are hilarious. <laughs> Y'all go back and forth. I'm like, that's the kind of teacher I want. You know, it's, <laughs> it's just real. But what are some of the greatest lessons and takeaways you've learned from your career being a special education teacher? Wow. Um, it's a great question. Well, you know, like I think that, you know, for many of us, particularly, you know, professionals who, uh, you know, like mo for most of my life, you know, when I would try at something and like try really hard, usually I would be able to be successful. Um, but the, one of the beautiful things about teaching is that, you know, you can spend eight to 10 hours on a lesson plan, like you think it's going to be amazing. And, you know, you have it all prepared and you're all ready. But then when you actually try to execute that lesson plan in class, you know, there are just so many different variables for how it's actually going to going to work, you know, like maybe your students are, are going through something or maybe you didn't plan or prepare something in the right way. But it's just one of the few things where you can prepare and still epically fail um, mm. in the moment. And so it's just like the beautiful thing about teaching and one of the reasons why it's so fulfilling just from like a pedagogical standpoint is that you, there's constant reflection. You always have to constantly like think about the ways in which your practice is, is helping the students and ways in which you're actually doing it to the best uh, of, of the young people. Um, but one of the, the things I love, the thing I love about teaching the most is just that like I wasn't, I, it, it wasn't about me. Like I, I was always focused on like my students' academic and social development. Um, and that was just like a really beautiful feeling because it pushes you to work so much harder because you don't want to let your students down. Um, but I learned so much from, from my students. They, you know, a lot of times we think of teaching as sort of top down, I'm teaching them, but it's really a facilitation. You know, I, I present information and, and they access it. And then I learn from them in terms of how they interact, it, interact with it. But, you know, like now during this campaign, I got my students texting me, you know, messages of support. They volunteer on my campaign. You know, it's just like real love. And, and it's something that like, I'll never forget and just keeps me moving. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> Thank you that. I want to move into um, some points. I want to move into a topic around civic engagement and everything. But I just... I do just want to say um, thank you for all that you've done, you know, in the community for being such a great teacher and educator to those students and, and the work that you do, because it is very important. You know, we need people who are real. We need people who care and we need people who, like you said, it's not a top down. It's, you know, we, we, we it's back and forth and we learn yeah. from each other and we can't mm -hmm. be, you're not, you're very humble. And so I just encourage you to stay that way as you continue to move forward and, and everything like that. So, um, oh, I actually want, oh, uh, we have a story here. Um, Trent Stevens says, I had the honor to substitute as a special ed teacher after serving in the military, and it was one of the most honorable things I've ever had the pleasure to do. I take my hat off to you, sir. Oh, well, thank you so much, Trent. Yeah. For that. And thanks thank for sharing that, purpose. Trent. Yeah, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Thank um, you for that. Yeah, you know, like, I, I recommend folks who uh, want to get into education, definitely get into it, especially in special education. Um, I think one of the most beautiful things is that so many of our students with disabilities, they aren't unfortunately, they don't get the proper services that they're supposed to be getting in the classroom. So, you know, you can really make a difference as a special education teacher by, by demystifying the classroom for students, by making it accessible, by allowing students who have been told for so long that they can't succeed, been put down, been stigmatized, by allowing them and showing them that, you know, they are just as good as anyone else. In many cases, they think even better, think more critically, um, and are more passionate and empathetic uh, about about other people, so I shout, yeah, definitely Trent. Uh, much respect to you, my brother, and folks who want to get into education. I recommend special education; it's beautiful. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, I want to show a point that was brought up about um, show a comment that about a point that was brought up earlier. This is from a, another brother of ours who's doing great work with the Eritrean Youth Project in Montreal. If you're familiar with them, if not, would love to connect you all. But they're doing phenomenal work in Montreal and Quebec, and. Um, he had made a comment about your point earlier saying, love your point about Africans needing to recognize their freedoms were made possible due to the struggles and civil rights movements of African Americans. Amen. Say yeah. that again. It's um, important. It's so important. And um, I just thank you for being with us here tonight, Danny, and being here from Montreal. Um, and yeah, just I had to bring that up because on the topic of students and working with the youth, I think it'd be awesome. You just just to connect and everything. Um, just yeah, want, for sure. Just want to show some other comments we got here. Oh, <laughs> there's a few people that are just uh, clapping again, saying hello. Again, if you're just tuning in, um, let us know where you're tuning in from. Drop some you know, hearts, drop a comment, drop a question. I see we have Scotland in the building. I see we have Atlanta, oh, 
I see we have Vegas again. Um, it's late out in Scotland. That's okay. Yes. That's love. That's love. That's real. <laughs> That's real. Oh, and we have right. uh, Marta, who's one of the leaders of the Eritrean Youth Project as well. She says, shout out to Eritrean Youth Project. Thank you guys. Yeah. We love y'all. Keep up the great work as well. And I think this is a great segue into um, civic engagement because even organizations like Eritrean Youth Project in Montreal, or you have you know groups that are working to serve in various capacities, right? In communities and cities and states. How do you define civic engagement and why is it important, especially during the times that we're living in today? Yeah, you know, to me, it's just about um, being engaged in your community and being active in your community. I think, uh, you know, I've seen on this campaign, a lot of times people tell me, oh, like, you know, you're not involved with your community because I haven't done anything in terms of public office before. But I'm like, you know, I've been a teacher for <laughs> 10 years. Like, you know, the idea, it's just like, it's such a, a, an interesting and sort of stringent, limited idea of what engagement means. But I think in so many of our communities, there are different ways to be involved and to, um, you know, support the growth of our community and, and just be su a support in general. Um, you know, right now, particularly in our schools, you see that a lot of our, particularly if you're living in a low, low income area, a lot of our schools struggle where it comes to, you know, not as many uh, PTA resources or even having PTAs, because particularly in low income communities, uh, parents are much more likely to be working. It's so like that's just like a huge thing that like one could just get involved with and make a dramatic impact uh, in a school. But, you know, like when it comes to activism, when it comes to political involvement, there are just a lot of ways that, that folks can get involved that particularly us as first generation Americans, we're not always aware of because our parents are focused so much on what's happening back in the motherland, particularly in the Eritrean Ethiopian context, because there's always been a lot, a lot going on mm -hmm. back there. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that has made it so that, you know, you know, like my mom has been in this country for 50 years, like 50 years. That's the vast majority of her life. She's been here, even though if you were to interact with her, you would think that she's, you know, like straight out of Addis. But you know, <laughs> she's been here for 50 years. And so much of the of the Eritrean community I've seen here in New York, they've always been focused on what's happening back home, that they actually haven't mobilized their power to actually uh, ex exert political influence in New York. Um, and, you know, New York might not be the best example because our community is small. But like, you know, D.C., Atlanta, I know y'all have big populations. Mm -hmm. What are the ways in which we're, we're leveraging our local power? And I know we're seeing it a lot more. Um, I know that, you know, we're now having more and more uh, Eritrean and Ethiopians into political office. Uh, and we can advocate for the needs of our people here at home because we have real needs here. Right. We have housing issues. We have education issues. You know, we have issues with incarceration as well. And of course, we have immigration things that we can be able to articulate. So um, I think just on the Eritrean Ethiopian front. You know, we, we have to sort of mobilize our political power, not only for back home, you know, back in the motherland, but also over here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm so glad you mentioned that because I, I, I do love the fact that, you know, and for those of you who are tuning in who are not Eritrean or Ethiopian, obviously, y'all know this platform is for everybody, for all of mm -hmm. our brothers and sisters. But both Andom and I are connected to Ethiopian Eritrea. We're both uh, products of immigrants. We are both um, daughter and son of immigrants. And that came from. Eritrea and Ethiopia. And so that's that's one reason why we're trying to encourage a lot of viewers that are tuning in right now who are um, Ethiopian and Eritrean to know that you should be getting involved. You can still be involved, you know, at home, back home in Africa, but you also got to know that your involvement locally is, is very important as well. And you can do that in so many different ways. Um, and just to just to even name a couple of others that that we all need to be doing this year is a filling out the census and b voting. So I would love for you to um, hit on those points on why everybody tuning in, I don't care where you're from in the U.S., needs to be completing both of those tasks. Yeah. So, I mean, the census is, is extremely important because that is how uh, the allocations of funds to states and localities are determined. So in general, we see that in low income areas, which because of what I was talking about before about America's history are disproportionately uh, uh, people of color we see that the census is completed at a lower rate. In communities with high concentration of immigrant population, census is com completed as a, at a lower rate. A lot of that is because of sort of the xenophobia that we hear from the likes of Trump and others. They think that their information will be used against them um, by ICE, for example. Um, but you know, the census isn't used in that way. It's really just about allocating uh, federal monies. Um, and so we need to make sure we're completing it because our state, the state that you're in and the congressional districts that you have, they'll lose money based on uh, if, if not enough people complete it because they do it based on population. So it's hugely important to complete the census. We also want to know like 
we also want to have good data in terms of, uh, you know, like, like black people and like where black people are coming from and, and the, the socioeconomic status of black people. And, you know, not only black people, just of all people. Um, but when we're actually able to collect good data, we can then use it, disaggregate that data and then create targeted interventions to really help people. Um, this is what the role of government should be. It's not always what's done because obviously, you know, people have different interests, um, particularly when it comes to uh, when dealing with people of color. But that's why the census is extremely important. When it comes to voting, you know, like, you know, you know what it is, right? Like we have, it's not just about the presidential though. Like we know what's at stake with Trump, but in local offices, there are also huge decisions that are made in, in Congress. That's where the laws uh, are passed. That's how money is, is uh, basically decided how it's going to be allocated for funding. So, you know, we got to vote in all elections. Don't only pay attention to the presidential, pay attention to your congressional, your mayoral race. Absolutely. Prime, um, you know, your local op your local runs are just as important as national. So definitely take those seriously. Um, so wherever you're tuning in from, again, just drop those locations, drop some comments, drop some um, some questions for us. We'll try we'll try and get through them. Um, we have Amin Muhammad who says valid points. Thank you for that. Hello, Amin Muhammad. Thank you for tuning What's in. Up? What's up? Trent, uh, Trent Stevens in Carbondale, Illinois. In the house. Uh, okay, Illinois. That's a very special place for me. That's where I served as a news reporter and anchor in Carbondale. So just sending wow. my love. Yeah, sending my love to the entire Southern Illinois community. I miss y'all and I love y'all and just sending a lot of light, um, especially during these times. Where, where's Chicago relative to, to Carbondale? It's about five hours south. Oh, damn. Okay. Yeah. Or, oh, sorry, five hours north. From Southern Illinois, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Southern yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um. So we have some people from Michigan. We got some people from Canada. We got some people from Colorado. We just want to say thank you all for being a part of this conversation where we're talking about civic engagement, running for office, and um, just being a leader during this time. Um. Oh, yeah. I miss you all too, Trent, and everyone out there. Um. I do want to show some comments here as well. Minalik says, Aizo, Berta Hadjoha, we are with you. I know what Aizo uh, means. Aizo <laughs> means, yeah, we, um, keep going. You got this. Yeah, yeah. And Adjoha, thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Adjoha, thank yeah. you. Oh, Berta, like, Berchi, like, keep going. Like, my, my Tigrinya is terrible, but like, I know, I know words here and there. But, yeah. <laughs> mine too, mine too. But I know, I know, that's how I, I saw the Aizo, which means, you know, uh, hey, like, Aizo is like, Take care, like be, you, you got this. And then Barachi is like the, I guess, woman version of Barata and Ajoha, which means hang on, keep going. Exactly, exactly. You. Thank you, Minalik. We appreciate that. And little lesson of Tigrinya, I'm hard. <laughs> we're, we're in the same boat here, all right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Virginia in the building. All right, so I want to take uh, some of your questions here. Um, we have Jonas Waldu in. Uh, Vegas. In Vegas. Jonas, what's up? Shout out to Jonas, who's very active in the community there as well. But he did ask a couple questions. When is your primary? And he also asked, please share the importance of donations. <laughs> yeah. So um, the primary is June 23rd, you know, under 30 days. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it, the way the American political system is, money in politics is a, is a huge thing. Campaigns run for over a year. And, you know, you're basically like creating many, you're creating organizations. Uh, and so, like, you know, I have a lot of staff and we have expenses in terms of being able to engage with voters. Uh, and, and that's why donations are so important. Donations are really investments in our campaign uh, and they're investments in our message and the movement we're trying to build. So, you know, if folks are able to donate. That means a lot. Uh, you can check out my website, andomforny.com, A-N-D-O-M-F-O-R-N-Y.com. And, and yeah, you know, you could donate if you're able, if you're not able, you know, we'd love to have you volunteer. Um, really what we're trying to do is just engage with our community. So the money that you donate, it allows us to send mailers out, allows us to make phone calls. Um, and so that's what that's about. Thank you, Jonas, for the question. Thank you, Jonas, for the question. And thank you all of, uh, all of you for tuning in tonight, for showing your love. You know, I'm so glad we're having this conversation. You guys know these community conversations center around different topics. We've talked about um, several different different topics. And um, it's, I think this conversation is very, very important, especially right now. So um, I do just kind of want to also say, oh, for those of you who are just now tuning in, we're talking about everything from the importance of civic engagement, getting involved in your communities. We're talking about running for office. Andom here is running for Congress in New York. So he's been sharing his journey with us. He's been sharing some of the challenges he's overcome. 
Um, and then we're also just talking about leadership in general, you know, responding to so many things that are happening right now in our society. So that's also been something we, uh, we've been talking about as well. So if you have any questions, definitely drop them. Thank you for the hearts, uh, Voice of Queens. We appreciate that. Um, and we appreciate all of you guys for being in here. And we have Isayas who says, shout out to Handan Andom. Love your work, guys. And we love you back. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, so, yeah. So I do want to talk about, um, you know, a couple more questions here. But I want you to talk about resilience because you mentioned some of the, I guess, donation money will go toward allowing you guys to help, you know, um, you know, push out mailers, make calls, you know, get the word out and, and also make progress with your campaign. But um, you had shared once that, you know, you I think it was on Humans of New York, but you would for four hours, for four hours, you'd be calling, mm -hmm. making no connection, yeah. zero connection. So what keeps you going? All those rejections, you keep getting turned down and then, you know, for four hours and then you finally get that connection. But I know I'm sure now it's a little different, but what's been keeping you resilient and going throughout this journey? Yeah, I mean, you know, you just have to trust the process and, and the plans that you make. Uh, you know, for me, this is my first time running. So I've had the good fortune of being able to surround myself with a lot of people who have experience in this. And, you know, there's a lot of studies on, on sort of the normative ways in which one should campaign and what should be done. And so I've tried to read as much on that. And, you know, calling people to donate is just one of the realities of campaigning within the American political system. Uh, it's not easy. It's difficult. But, you know, you got to trust the process and trust, you know, what what has worked for people in the past. And, you know, it is it, it does work. It's just a challenge as someone who is a challenger, you know, as a, as a new challenger. It's a little bit difficult. But, you know, you just got to keep going. Um, and the reason why we're able to keep going is because I have a good team with me and because I know that uh, in the long run, what we're trying to do is, is for the benefit of the community. So that allows me to keep going. Absolutely. And as we wrap up here, um, of course, we just want to say thank you so much for your time. I, I do want to end on a couple notes. We'll show another comment here. Um, we got, oh, we got Amhari um, Gensa Green. Yeah, okay, I see it. Oh, okay. Nifat from San Diego. Thank you. Thank you guys <laughs> again. Um, but yeah, you know, as a leader, you know, we've been talking about leadership and everything, but you know, you are uh, pursuing this leadership role. You're already a leader in your community, but you know, we look to people like you during these times, during these challenging times and these, you know, struggles we're trying to overcome. What message can you share with us? You know, um, because we're just, we're all trying to hold on to hope, you know, we're all trying to push through, um, whether it's, you know, um, the, the pandemic that we're living in or watching, you know, these brothers and sisters die at the hands of police brutality and gun violence and so many just injustices. What message do you, can you share with us um, to just lift our spirits and keep us going during these times? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know about necessarily lifting one's spirits. I mean, they are uh, somber times for, for sure with the pandemic, with all of the police violence that's going on, the struggles that that are going on in this country. Um, you know, I think it's it's important to acknowledge that, and it's it's okay to be to be vulnerable. It's okay to let people know that that things are not that you're that one is struggling with with dealing with something. I think a lot of times. Uh, you know, particularly amongst Eritreans and Ethiopians, you know, also within the black community, we see that it's, it's you know, we want to display strength and we don't, we see strength sometimes as not allowing ourselves to open up for vulnerability, for um, just like allowing our emotions to, to be able to be there for, for engagement with other people. And I think that's okay. And I think it's even important to be honest, to, to engage, engage that with folks. Um, so I think it's important to be vulnerable. Um, and I also think it's just in, in it's super important to, um, and it's a little bit difficult now because of like the virtual nature of everything, but you know, we really have to just uh, uh, dig deep and, and entrench ourselves within our community. Uh, whatever that community is, you know, like if before it was, you know, your, your workout community, you can't have that, but maybe you can still get in, down with them in Zoom. You know, if it's the area in Ethiopian community, you maybe can't go to the community center anymore, but hopefully you're still, you know, staying in contact with them. So, you know, try to continue with those routines that you had that allow you to have that strength, that allow you to be built up um, because we're really isolated right now. And when folks are isolated, that's what contributes to anxiety and, and sort of sometimes those mental health struggles. So, you know, we want to make sure we're having uh, honest connections with people that care about us uh, and, and also allowing ourselves to be vulnerable. Yeah, absolutely. Well, 
I mean, that that definitely brought some some peace to me. Just you know, knowing that, like, yeah, we're we're we don't always have to be um, perfect. It's not it's not like every day is going to be perfect. Like, it's okay to not be okay. And I think that as a leader, being able to uh, recognize that and and be truthful in that and honest with that and be vulnerable yeah. is just so important. So thank you for that message definitely, during these definitely. times. And I would just like to end with: How can people stay in touch? How can people support you? What are ways they can get involved? Yeah, thank you so much, Hannah. You know, like I'm pretty open on on social media, uh, on Instagram. Andom for NY. Andom for NY is my handle. A N D O M F O R N Y. Same handle uh, on Twitter and also on Facebook. You know, Facebook sometimes gets a little bit uh, overwhelmed with messages, but certainly on Instagram, I, I can I can definitely reply. Instagram and Twitter. Um, so add me, uh, hit me up. Love to collaborate with anyone throughout the country, throughout the world. Um, on, on issues of, of social justice that are important. So yeah, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm thankful for the opportunity and looking to connect with any of y'all. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andom, for being here and everything to all of you who tuned in. Thank you all so much. We are just so thankful to have you all um, with us tonight from all the different locations we mentioned. Um, I know we're all going through tough times and we just want to send you a lot of love. We want to send you a lot of um, light. We want you to know that it's okay to not be okay, but you know, I do truly believe there are better days ahead. I can't tell you when, but I do believe that. So stay, um, stay, stay around people that love you. Just be able to take the breaks you need um, and just know that we're here for you. We love you and we're sending you a lot of light. So from our hearts to your hearts, stay safe, take care and see you next time. Peace out, everybody. Bye bye.